Hello and welcome to Beyond the Paradigm. I'm your host, Paul Brackell. My special guest today is Stan Deo. Stan has held above top secret clearance. He has worked undercover for the FBI and he took part in an exclusive black project headed by Dr. Edward Teller, which was developing spacecraft technology. So I'm sure that this episode is going to fascinate you as we discuss Stan's research into the Garden of Eden, Atlantis, and other advanced technology. If you enjoyed this episode, it'd be appreciated if you give it a like and also subscribe to the channel. And it'd be appreciated that if you leave a comment in the comment section as feedback. Sit back and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the show, Stan Deo. Thank you. And uh, where are you broadcasting from? Well, I'm over here in North Wales. I'm not originally from here, but I live in North Wales. Uh, moved oh, yeah. here about four years ago. I don't know. From have where? you ever been to the UK, Stan? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. I have uh, been in the countryside there visiting uh, relatives and, uh, uh, of course, into London. But uh, many years ago, uh, on my return from, uh, oh, where was it? From uh, Yugoslavia, I came through uh, London. So, yeah. I had my right. I like London. I was there last year. Bit bit different than where I live. Very busy, but a lot of uh, nice architecture in London. But it's um, it's a troubled place. Let's put it that way. So, you've led a very interesting life, if I must. Um, and I, I like I told you off there. I've listened to a few podcasts you've done, but for people who may not have heard you speak before or haven't read uh, any of your books. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what led you into what you're doing now and led you to write your books, the book, one of the books, Cosmic Conspiracy? Um, all right. Well, look, um, well, uh, I'm probably going to shorten this a bit, but uh, yeah. the full biography is on our website at standeo.com, S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O.com. At the very bottom of the page, you can see Stan's bio. Click on that and you'll see more than uh, what I'm going to tell you here, but uh, some of it. Um, uh, I was born and raised in uh, Texas, and uh, then after that, I went to the Air Force Academy here in Colorado, and then over to uh, Australia eventually to uh, work on a secret government project under Dr. Edward Teller, famously known as the father of our hydrogen bomb. Um, and uh, I stayed down there for 30 years uh, during the project and after, because I stayed down there for a while. Now, during my time in Australia, um, I uh, was approached by a company to uh, MC or to, uh, you know, introduce a uh, TV documentary on Nikola Tesla. And with them, I traveled uh, through uh, uh, Europe and into uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, while it was still run by the Russians, interesting time at the airports with all the gun-toting people. But anyway... Um, went over there and we um, we filmed this the documentary um, which is on the internet on YouTube I think you can see it there uh, and eventually when that aired I got offered uh, a spot on a TV show in Perth uh, and it was called UFOs are here and it was a documentary uh, made uh, by Guy Baskin uh, from uh, England um, and the documentary had all the leading lights of the UFO field at the time. Uh, and uh, one of them uh, was, um, oh, well, what's his name? The the actor that uh, did, uh, oh, gosh. Anyway, you can read about all that in there on it anyway. I'm starting to get old and be uh, like Biden, I'm afraid. I can't remember names <laughs> quite uh, quickly anymore. But, um, yeah, and I did three series there. Uh, UFOs are here, uh, UFOs, Day with you, and UFOs are back. And um, the uh, the show was quite a hit, and I was approached by a, a company to write my uh, book. And uh, they lived over in Melbourne. I was in Perth, and they couldn't do it. They said it was too hard because of all the political implications and whatever. So I took the contract from them and. Uh, wrote my own book and published my own book. And with the help of a number of Christian folks, we uh, financed the first printing and then ended up selling over oh, 260, 70,000 copies of it in 27 countries. Um, and that launched uh, a lot of other things for me to do. 
which were all things aimed at spreading the word and helping people be uh, saved, you know, by Jesus. And uh, because of that, I've been all over the world. I've been to North Africa, to Australia, New Zealand, uh, Europe, uh, well, England, of course. And uh, and there I've done things that uh, were quite interesting. Um, I discovered the Garden of Eden in North Africa. Uh, in Tanzania, in the Ngoro Crater, I used the Bible, Biblical Hebrew Genesis, and uh, uh, did a deep dive into the Hebrew and was able to find the, the clues that I needed to locate the Garden of Eden exactly. Um, I wrote a book about it called The Vindicator Scrolls, uh, and I think that was in 1989. At that time, um, we didn't have Google Earth and things and maps that we could use. It's still all printed stuff. So I traced uh, the, the uh, clues in the Bible to find the Garden of Eden all the way to the Danical Plain, where I thought it must be that these four rivers I discovered outside of Africa all came to a head there. Hmm. Well, uh, time passed, and uh, the, there was a company over in California that gave uh, Google uh, Google Maps a really detailed bathymetry map, and they even sent me a copy of it. And I used that and was able to find out that the Garden of Eden wasn't there it was further uphill from there um up the great east african rift up into tanzania where the uh, volcanic like plateau or i don't know what else you'd call it is had a hundred mile square mile uh, uh, crater called the girl girl crater and then up the top of it was where the water gushed up from lake victoria underneath where the volcanoes heated it and blew up the mountains uh, up the mountain water hot water which then descended down and I was able to find the four rivers of uh, Eden and where they had uh, chewed, you know, weakened the, the earth in between the continents and Pangaea so that later when the asteroid hit that caused the flood, it split, caused the, the earth to start expanding and split and the continents to, to move rapidly apart. Um, this bull, they try to tell you about it taking so many millions of years for plates, tectonics to move stuff. That's just rubbish. Um, it's uh, it's very easily provable by the uh, the uh, geographic record, and also if you use the proper timing on the argon gas bubbles dating, uh, you know that's another whole argument. But um, anyway, I, I traced these uh, four rivers, and then I uh, gave a lecture on it, uh, well in 2016, I think, in 2018, a young couple, Christian couple uh, here in Philadelphia, said, uh, "Hey." Uh, you know, uh, we'd like to go down there and film that. So, you know, will you go with us? I'll oh, share. And that was a long trip, I got to tell you. I was, mm -hmm. what, uh, 73 or 4 at the time. And uh, very trying. Uh, and uh, we went there. We were 10,000 feet altitude at the upper part of the plateau. And we found the place and we filmed it and talked to the the uh, Masai, who were the current uh, kind of watchmen of that area. And uh, you can see that again online. Uh, it's um, There's links to it uh, on my show images page. So if you go to standio.com and the upper right corner, you'll see a, a, some text that says show images. Go there and uh, scroll down. You'll see you know pictures from the Garden of Eden and uh, links to videos, all that kind of stuff that you could use. Uh, I thought it was quite important, actually, uh, to, to do that Garden of Eden uh, research. And I... I don't know, it takes a bit of time, but I probably ought to tell you why I started looking for the Garden of Eden, because that wasn't my objective in life normally. Um, in in uh, Perth, up in the hills uh, at uh, Calamunda, we had a home up there, and uh, one evening out when it was dark, we had uh, two pet rabbits up, up at the fence at the top end of the property, and over to my left, I could see the driveway going out of the street coming like this. And I was leaning on my shovel, looking at those rabbits, looking up at me, and I was thought, you know, that's like God must have been in the Garden of Eden, you know, looking at humans. Uh, and uh, mm. I, I wonder what they're thinking. As I thought that, suddenly I felt the earth was like I was moving with the earth. And then it was like a combination lock. My body locked into this movement, and the earth and I, you know, everything just seemed to be moving all linked together. And uh, it was such an impressive uh, event, whatever it was, that I went in the house, told the wife about it. I said, you know, it's weird. Maybe I ought to look for the Garden of Eden. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which I did, too, and uh, did find over a period of uh, several years. And when I was down in Australia, the reason I went down there 
was because in uh, Dallas, uh, where I was in the computer industry, I also was researching privately in a lab I built at my home into anti-gravity. And somehow, the, um, the secret project people, they found out about what I was uh, doing there, uh, making these uh, designs and testing uh, toroidal fields to make artificial gravity. Well, somebody broke into my house there during the day while I was at the office, and I suppose it was one of the government people. They didn't take much. And then I was approached uh, by a fellow there in uh, Dallas, a doctor who was working with people at NASA and, and, and Dr. Teller. And he said, how would you like to come down to Australia and, you know, finish your research with us into, you know, flying saucers? And I said, oh, sure, yeah, right. And they made all the arrangements and sold my house and, uh, you know, gave me all the shots I needed and uh, sent me and my family down to Australia to work there for a Welshman, by the way. Uh, of Sir John Williams, uh, Captain Sir John Williams. He was my control agent there in Melbourne. Um, and um, so I proceeded to write papers and do research for them and to learn a lot about what we had done, humans had done, with these uh, fallen ones, the, what they called uh, aliens, extraterrestrials. And I suppose people that come through the, the parallel universe gateway into our reality are kind of extraterrestrials, so it's a proper tame, a name for them. But uh, they were part of a, a war uh, on the other side of the gateway through, you know, our universe to, to the universe where, where God lives, our creator. And um, when they were put down here, they didn't get to bring in a lot of their technological toys with them. They were part of a, of a rebellion, a war, and they were, they were cast down here through the gate for a time, a uh, future time, when they would confront the uh, Messiah and his father, our creator, in the Battle of Armageddon. Now, we learned this over a period of time. I'm condensing a lot of stuff. But um, anyway, the the, um, the gateway uh, works on a, a principle similar to what we use for anti-gravity. And that's why it was important uh, to, to tell you about, um, you know, my, my research into anti-gravity was because of the gateway issues. And you go over in uh, the history of Samaria, the Sumerians built ziggurats, you know, square pyramids. And uh, I, I got a hold of the blueprints of the top floor of one of them on the uh, Marduk Stila that the Germans uh, captured uh, during World War II. And part of it was damaged by fire, but what we could salvage, I could see up the top, uh, there was a like a doorway into nothing, uh, which they said was where the gods came through and landed on Earth. And uh, apparently these the god uh, creators that came down to the Sumerians told the Sumerians, look, uh, you have to leave food and drink for us on each of three levels as we come down and wait and come down and wait until we get down to you because otherwise our energy density of our atoms would be so much higher than yours that we would kill you if we touched you by accident. So they would discharge your energy and come down and meet with people. Um, and it was really quite interesting to see that blueprint in the little special room, the circle drawing and everything else. The portal, it was like... Um, um, that TV show or series years ago, Stargate. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it didn't have all the details of the motor or the engine or whatever, but they had that round symbol there at, in the middle of that little uh, room at the top of the ziggurat. I've often wondered, you know, why so many cultures have built pyramids of some description, I mean, all over the planet. Mm. And the best I can figure is that when uh, uh, God got mad at, you know, at the rebellion, cast them down to earth um we can see that there were nearly 200 of them uh, that landed at uh, uh what do they call it mount Hermon, Har harman in syria and from there they split out uh, to south america north america uh, uh, europe uh, you, you know africa all these places where these pyramids appear is where these these uh, 200 fallen ones uh, where they split out to make their own communities now, one of the communities they made that we're familiar with is called Atlantis in the modern idiom. And it was where Poseidon, one of the fallen ones, made his kingdom. His uh, castle was on uh, the Damam Island on the uh, the Iraqi side of the Persian Gulf. Uh, well, sorry, facing Iraq and the mountains there and across the Persian Gulf. And it's there today. And the discussions of it, the descriptions of it that were in Genesis, um, you know, I, I looked uh, for that as well uh, from the Plato dissertations on where Atlantis was and how to find it. 
and I, I related this to the Great Flood and impacts and what sank Atlantis. But you can see it today. You can see that there are nearly 1,500 artifacts, uh, at least that many, on the uh, surface of Saudi Arabia, which was where um, the majority of Atlantis was. And um, it's it goes back to a time, you know, when the, they don't really have written records and scrawls on stones and whatever else. But Poseidon married a, an earth woman there, had uh, five sets of twins. And it was in modern times because even one of the towns named after one of his sons um, is over on the uh, eastern uh, uh, side of the, mm, the Great East African Rift, or the Jordan River is called uh, in that area. And it's um, uh, it still bears part of his name there, uh, indicating that uh, that's where that son lived. And the biblical accounts during the time of uh, Moses talk about Moses being sent around sorry, uh, uh, Joshua later um, went around and was told by God to kill all the animals and living things in certain villages, wipe it clean, just kill everything they had life. And um, it's it, during the time when uh, David uh, confronted uh, Goliath, the giant, because there were several giants in that tribe, his brothers, you know, Goliath's brothers as well. And um, so in, in that time, you know, that modern time, we had giants that were leftovers from the flood, which destroyed most of these things, but they had to be killed, and all their DNA and you know polluted DNA, which the fallen ones had uh, made, um, that had to be wiped out. They could not be allowed to be here and have the spirit of the of the beings that they, that they were uh, to to live here anymore. Um, and you know the legends of Hercules and the gods, the, the Greeks talked about it. These were demigods. Um, and they placed their habitation all along the Levant area into uh, northern Israel and into uh, Upper Jordan and Lower Syria and uh, Lebanon. Um, and that's why they built what's called the Decapolis cities. The Greeks built them there in northern Israel mm -hmm. and in part of uh, Jordan as well, which were to honor these various gods. Now, um, why didn't the Greeks do it over, you know, in Greece? Why did they come over here? Because they that's where they saw the gods came from, like Hercules and all that kind of stuff. So all these things tie together. And uh, so in addition to finding the Garden of Eden, which I, I, I told you I'd done in 2016, I think it was, um, I now was able to find Atlantis and tie it to that culture that was killed by by God but causing this huge flood that went all the way around the planet and swirling, you know, vortices of, of water and waves. I was able to find that place and find why it's above water now, because you can see on the, the hills of Turkey over there near um, uh, Antioch, uh, you can see the layers of water, and there's a 1,650 foot deep depth showing that it had been underwater and then raised up by an impact over in the Indian Ocean that tilted the plate of um, Saudi Arabia up like this. And that was where the, um, the, the rising up you know, eventually occurred was uh, Atlantis was sunk by the impact first, uh, destroyed, cracked up, and then raised up as the Earth expanded its diameter 25%, and as the the impact of that uh, asteroid over there caused the tilt in that plate. Anyway, I tried to find every clue that was given in Poseidon's account, or sorry, in, in Plato's account of Poseidon, and um, then with the Garden of Eden, I tried to do that, the same thing with all the sources I could find that were ancient, talking about the location of, of Eden. I even think King Solomon knew where the Garden of Eden was from various activities he did to uh, get gold sent to him from that area. That's another whole story, by the way. I found where, where uh, King Solomon had his gold mines there in um, Madagascar off the coast of northeast Africa. Fascinating discussion on that one. Mm. But anyway, that's another time. Um Anyway, so I was down there for all this stuff, uh, wrote the book, uh, did the TV show, and then eventually several documentaries, um, and uh, then maybe 600 uh, various interviews over the years here in the United States and in other countries, um, trying to explain to people you know, what I'd done in life and how I'd been chosen to do this. Talked about my outer body experience in 1969. Um, and, uh, you know... Hundreds of thousands, millions of people later, I guess uh, I understand why all this had to happen to me. It, it certainly wasn't a pleasant trip. <laughs> I got to tell you, it was very busy and, and uh, in some cases almost lethal.
Under the one, yeah. Basically, I guess so, that's all. I... Yeah. So when you so when you say right, you found the Garden of Eden. I can imagine there's going to be a listener sat there thinking, "What does it actually mean to find the Garden of Eden?" Now, I've heard you talk about this previously, and obviously, when you went there and it wasn't as it's described in the Bible because I've heard you talk about like the parallel universe where God is. So when you say you found the garden of Eden, it's there's, there's sort of one here and one in the other world. Is Am I understanding that well, correctly? Well, there, there, there can be, uh, I obviously I haven't been able to go to the other one in the parallel universe, yeah. but um, what I found there was uh, this, this um, plateau, uh, which had uh, on the, southern sort of the southern part of it a volcano that's 10 miles across 100 square miles that had collapsed you know eons ago and so it had 2,000 foot high rim walls around it um i found uh, graves of the chiefs that had been buried there from the datoga and the Masai groups over the last um three and a half thousand years um, and they told me the story, I interviewed them, that the uh, this whole area was settled, was created by God up in the sky coming down into the Ngoro Ngoro crater there, creating man and his wife, and then going back up into the sky to leave the man and his wife to live outside of the garden. Uh, and that, that closely parallels, of course, the Garden of, of Eden uh, story in the Bible. So looking at this and how reverently the natives, you know, treated this area as where God created the Adamic man, I, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, are there any signs here in this hundred square miles that this was ever a Garden of Eden? Right now, I mean, when I was there, the whole hundred square miles was sprouting very brilliant yellow African daisies. And on the sides were fig trees and uh, other kinds of trees uh, in, in the Lingai Forest at the south end. Um, and there was a, a lake. There's a salt lake now. But it uh, it was fed. It still is fed by water that came down over the rim from the north of the plateau and, and put water all through the garden. Very lush. And uh, there were like 25,000 large animals that lived there. You know, uh, animals like uh, zebra lions, um, uh, elephants, um, monkeys, uh, all kinds. So I thought, well, this really sounds like a place. And the fact that there are fig trees growing all over the place, and the Bible said that, uh, you know, uh, Eve used fig leaves to cover their nakedness after they realized they'd done the wrong thing and ate at the tree of knowledge. I thought, well, I wonder where the two trees are. Well, mm -hmm. obviously they're not there anymore, but there is an area um, almost in the center, but slightly to the northwest side of the center of the crater it's a raised area called ingatati hill and it's round it used to probably be the very top of the volcano before it collapsed and fell down and left this there and there are this this um, hill is divided into two halves there's a, a spring that came up in the middle and went down and flowed down into the rest of the garden but that spring separated two mounds where we assume the two trees were buried. When I talked to the Tanzanian scientists in the area, they said, yeah, we're studying the dirt there because it's a miracle dirt because it says stuff that planted in that, in that dirt just grows incredibly well and large and healthy. So whatever's in that Ingatati Hill, you know, is really great stuff. So that indicated to me another proof that this was the Garden of Eden spoken of in so many cultures history. And, um, you know, people said to me, yeah, but look, you know, that might have been Adam and Eve and all that kind of stuff. But how do you explain, you know, these homo erectus, you know, skeletons and all these uh, cavemen over the years? And I said, well, look, they were probably there and uh, were part of the ecostructure, you know, developing. But Adamic man is different. Adamic man was built by God and had a communication line straight from your, their bodies to God. They were they were special. And they were smarter, and they were able to, to do a lot more things than just the normal homo indigenous could do. And eventually, the, the indigenous, you know, died out, um, and, uh, you know, the cavemen were gone, but the Adamic man survived. Um, gosh, there's so many things to... Uh, my mind wants to race off to other parts of that, but um, uh, I did meet with these people, and, and um, we... Uh, uh, 
we did meet with uh, one guy that was uh, a, a Datoga chief. That's the original people that guarded the Garden of Eden. But uh, they were they were a bit silly trying to tell me what you know the the history of it was and you know how God and life and death worked. And I had a translator there working with me. And when I realized the guy was leading me on, I I told him I said no no tell you know tell him I I don't want that I want the truth about it let's let's don't tell that kind of stuff. And we got down to the nitty gritty and. Uh, he uh, he then changed his story and showed me a spear he'd made, and uh, uh, we we discussed life and death and how you live on beyond this, and how you he could uh, talk with his sister occasionally in dreams, who is now oh, who is now deceased and things like that. Got to meet with the Kalahari Bushmen a little bit further up the trail. Interesting people, boy, they don't eat in a day if they don't find some game. Um, uh, it, it's amazing. We took videos of that too, out looking for game for them for that day. They do store things hanging on the trees to dry in the sun and use salt. But other than that, you know, they are they are very basic uh, the clothing, and their bows and arrows are like branches they've carved and stuff. Nothing like you get over at the hardware store. This is very mm. primitive. But um, mm. all of them talked about the god and gods that came down from the heavens to earth, and. Um, for that reason, I just really think that there is no no doubt in my mind that the Garden of Eden is there in the Angoro Angoro Crater, which in the native language means the big hole, <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, that that's where the, the story of, of Adam and Eve started. And we found out that they they had migrated; they'd been put out of the garden, and they'd migrated down the Great East African Rift in the Omo Valley uh, to the west of the rift. And went eventually down and crossed over into Saudi Arabia, where it's, which is where they met the uh, the fallen ones, uh, like from Poseidon and his uh, people that came with him. And that's where the Adamic man was bred uh, with other uh, DNA strands by Poseidon to make the giants uh, spoken of in the Bible. And so it was Adamic man that crossed over there, and and the fallen ones were trying to uh, breed a hybrid being that had the same abilities and communication line that the Adamic man had. Very, very interesting tales. But, um, you know, I I looked for where Poseidon lived according to uh, 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 Plato's account. And he talked about Poseidon's temple there on the, the, the coast of the Persian Gulf. He, he uh, said his temple had two water sources. He caused hot water and cold water to come up and make his drinking water and his bath water there on the island. I found those supplies in the stratigraphic and the geological surveys around that area. You can see where the hot water came from this layer here, so many hundred feet below, and the cold water from here from the rains. And, you know, there's even that, down to that degree, a proof that that was where that settlement uh, of uh, Poseidon's group was and, and uh, you know, created the legend of Atlantis. Um, but as I say, there were these beings in other areas. Um, and as I mentioned earlier before, the Earth eventually, after that asteroid impact in the Indian Ocean, created the flood. The Earth broke, uh, expanded and broke apart Pangaea, which is when all the continents were together, and stretched it like that. Well, it helped me to solve a mystery that even the people living in a certain area here didn't know. But if you go uh, to uh, Africa, uh, Central, sorry, not Africa, South America, and go to the peninsula out there, um, the, um, the Yucatan Peninsula, the people there, when you ask them, why do you call yourself Yucatan? Don't know, just always called Yucatan. And I looked at the Bible record, um, you know, before the split of the descendants of Noah, there was one called Yakitan in English. In Hebrew, it's Yucatan. Oh, dear. Let me just cause, cause this to spit on the air. And um, the um, so that meant that they migrated across North Africa and into the Yucatan uh, uh, potential when it was still over here in the Atlantic Ocean and scrunched up very close to them. So that's how they got their name. Uh, Yucatan was from Yucatan. Uh, in the Hebrew, and that explains that, of course, they had the technology of pyramids and stuff there, and certainly that, that descendant of Noah would have known that and carried that technology and archaeology over to um, the northern part of South America. 
anyway gosh there's just so many things well, i want to tell you but uh, yeah <laughs> well see yeah. it's so fascinating i could i mean i know for a fact stan you've you've got multiple episodes of information <laughs> at your disposal anyway but one of the things i wanted to talk to you about so uh, you've had top secret clearance and you've worked on black projects including on like anti-gravity technology and within what we probably call a spacecraft or whatever but in terms of like aliens and what we know as the fallen ones as you've been saying like obviously we don't believe in little green men from other planets but what what contact do you think that the governments of the world like have with these beings like are they in contact with them like continually did they receive like guidance from them plans you know te technology did they what sort of information is being passed yes we did get that uh in fact when when these fallen ones that were cast out from the parallel universe into ours when they were sent here they weren't able to take a lot of technology with them and they, they plan to make war against uh, Jesus and against uh, our creator, God. Um, so they were going to have to build, you know, new technology here that they could put together. To do that, they needed to have uh, mineral resources and uh, workmen, uh, you know, various other technology to, to support being able to build these weapons. They came to us and they said, look, we've been here for, you know, thousands of years. And uh, according to one report, uh, they told our guys, if you want to see the crucifixion of Jesus, we'll show you. Because we were there and took images in 3D, you know, videos of the crucifixion. And he was one of our guys, they would say. And uh, anyway, they said, look, we'd like to have access to uh, uh, underground bases, underwater bases, secret uh, facilities to continue our research. And we'll share with you anti-gravity and medicine, things like that, if you'll help us set up the infrastructure underground, underwater, underground, to continue developing uh, our technology and support ourselves, but we don't want to interfere with your uh, culture. So, you know, the human culture. So we'll we'll liaise with you like this, but we'll do our work underground out of sight and help you uh, to solve your planet and bring it to peace and all that kind of stuff. So that was the setup, and that was from uh, about 1945, 47, somewhere in that period when that started, and, and we had the agreement with these aliens or fallen ones and the fact that they are some of them uh, gray and some of them look like uh, you know insectoids or you know uh, snakes or whatever reptilian uh, doesn't uh, contradict anything in the bible it just simply means that there were a lot of these forms that were cast down here uh, because in the heavens we see in the book of revelation where there are beings around the throne that are not like us winged beings and various other things but we we helped them, and uh, we helped them to build infrastructure, manufacturing that kind of stuff, and we mined, you know, minerals for them, and, and delivered it to, to a pickup point where their craft picked them up and zoomed off to the private places. And that went on until mid '70s. In 1973, at a, at a luncheon with my control officer, uh, Captain Sir John Williams, he told uh, Sir Henry Somerset across the table from me, he said, you know. Henry, they're moving in on us, meaning at the time I didn't understand what they were talking about, but it was meaning that the, the, the people we'd built these underground facilities for, these beings, were starting to move and threaten us to, to get out of their facilities. We were no longer welcome. And then as the next few years passed in the late 70s, uh, Earthmen were kicked out of all the facilities unless they took us in in groups you know, to do whatever they wanted to do with us and show us whatever they wanted to show, but we could no longer have free access to their technology and their civilization in these areas. Um, and I understand why now, but at the time it was quite interesting that they would turn on us like that and uh, kick us out. And it was just basically, thanks very much. You helped us get to the technological level we needed and to mine the areas we needed to mine. So we don't need you anymore. Get out. Um, but they still fly. They're all around us. And um, I can't tell you how to tell the difference between what we designed and what they designed or what they built. Uh, in fact, in some of the newer ones, I'm not sure that I know where their their main propulsion field is. Uh, in the early ones, I knew because they had three points on them. So any triangular craft or any saucer craft had three bright lights on it. It was using our normal gravitic or electrogravitic propulsion. But these cylinders, these TikToks that they filmed and various other things, I don't know how those uh, how exactly they work. 
but they must be somewhere along the lines of what we were working on to have that that ability to make uh, 20g turns in a fraction of an eye or a second and you know a blink of an eye and so they're here they let us coexist and what technology we do develop on our own they monitor and uh, so we're not allowed to to get in their way of what their plan is and basically as i can see it what their plan is it's not good for humans but what they want to do is control the whole planet to set up a planetary government and the humans that they need to produce and serve them will be allowed to live the others will they will they will die from floods disease whatever else and, and the bible you know does mention that this time is coming the deception that Jesus spoke of in the Bible, where he said that beware, there's going to be a great deception going to come on the earth. And even the very elect, meaning the very elect of his believers, would be fooled if such were possible. So it's probably going to mean that we're not going to be here when that happens. We've either already been put in the grave or we'll be raptured up. And uh, But when that time comes, when the earth is at... Um, crisis stage, uh, through a nuclear war, say in the Middle East or the United States, whatever, or, you know, if if the people of Earth are frightened by the disease spread, the, the threat of a new kind of uh, COVID that's going to kill everybody or super measles or whatever, and if we're threatened with a nuclear war, and if the world's economy collapses in a heap, and people are frightened to death and looking for someone to help them, at that time, these beings, which are the fallen ones, will offer technology and support to a leader that of the humans that they will appoint but it'll be a human and that's the bible speaks of an antichrist at this time and false prophets and stuff well this is where they will control those uh, two individuals and give them access to power to like bring lightning bolts down from orbit to strike targets and catch things on fire much like what happened to king solomon when he dedicated the, temp the temple the first temple <clears throat> anyway and um People will marvel at this, but they will, all the nations of the world will accept leadership of this off-world group because the alternative would be certain death by nuclear war and disease. They, they, they need help. And it's like President Reagan said at the UN, he said, look, I often wonder, he said, what would happen if all these warring nations of our planet were to suddenly be confronted with a common enemy, say little green men, he said. Would they bond together and be unified? And of course, that's very sound logic. I mean, uh, you know, if you've come from a family with uh, two or three children, you know that when the children are fighting and the dad says, stop or it's the belt or stop or it's some other painful thing, uh, people suddenly become friends. You know, brothers and sisters stop fighting and they say, well, look, you know, the wrath of dad is going to be bad. So, hey. And um, so that same thing applied to a planet would be just like Reagan was uh, suggesting. And, and for the record, uh, President Reagan's wife uh, bought a copy of my book, Cosmic Conspiracy, for him. And King Charles's dad, uh, the uh, Duke of Edinburgh, he had a copy of my book, uh, as did uh, young Prince Charlie, uh, King Charles. And um, there have been several world leaders who have got access to my um, my writing on this this deception, the reason it's going to happen, including uh, former President Bill Clinton. Uh, he came down to Australia once when I was down there with um, Jim Schlesinger, his uh, Secretary of Defense, and they passed a message to me through a civilian there over in uh, New South Wales that they had a copy of my book there in uh, the White House and, you know, in the, uh, uh, what do you call this, Privy Council, the um, uh, the, the people that he had, his advisors there in the White House, I forget what you call them here, but anyway, too long in the in the other country, I get the terms confused. Um, and uh, they said that uh, they told the civilian they gave this to, she asked about, asked uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense, asked him, would he share with her about the, the secrets behind UFOs? And he said, well, I can't tell you that's classified, but I can tell you if you contact this man, read his book, he'll tell you that what he's told you there is the correct solution of why we're holding all this technology back and where we're headed with it. And so he didn't violate national security, but he did point the lady to us, uh, to my book and various things. So uh, that's where we are now. We're, we're waiting for the game to start. And um, yeah. I know the Bible mentions the city of Damascus over in Northwest uh, Syria. It says overnight, the city of Damascus will become a ruinous heap of ashes. 
Now, it's going to either be from a volcanic eruption because there have been many in that area, or it's going to be from a nuclear device, but happening overnight indicates a sudden, like, bomb-type event. And so I tell people now, then, watch for Saudi Arabia and its allied 40 Arab nations, um, and they're gathering together, possibly with Iran, to uh, threaten to, to, in fact, to try to start to, to invade Israel. But at that time, Damascus is going to be nuked by either the, the American fleet in the Mediterranean or by the uh, IDF in Israel. Um, make no mistake about it, Israel has at least 800 nuclear weapons, so they can very well defend themselves. So something's going to happen, and I suspect the nuking of Damascus will be the clue that we all need to see. Yeah, well, if we're still here, obviously. But that, that will signal at the beginning of a cry for a new world order. And, and the blueprints are already on the table. Uh, yeah. Former President Trump's uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and the current prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, Salman, um, they are thick as thieves together and have billions of dollars between them and are, are uh, forming uh, like nuclear cities or like, well, not nuclear cities, but like new cities like um, um, Neo and stuff down the coast of Saudi Arabia down there. Yeah. And uh, the line. They're, they're make, say again? The line in Saudi yeah, Arabia. The line. That's, yeah, that's right, the line. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, Prince Ben Salman is a prince still. And so when I looked in the book of Daniel about the Antichrist coming to power, and it says he, whoever this guy is, is going to be a signature, a signing of the covenant between Israel and the many nations. Now, that covenant is part of the Abraham Accords that uh, Mohammed bin Salman and uh, Jared Kushner put together. Now, the way they got these people to sign already is presenting a business plan uh, for each country that was going to sign, saying, look, uh, if you accomplish this goal, that goal, and that goal, then we will give you this much money from the world treasury and uh, we'll bring you into the fold and take care of your country and everything would be wonderful. It's a business plan and you'll be profitable at the end of this period of time. Now, the business plan that they're going to make for uh, Israel and, this, and the rest of the nations that sign, they haven't made it yet. But when they do, it's going to be a seven-year uh, treaty or covenant. And we think that's the same thing spoken of by Daniel the prophet there uh, about the Antichrist of this time. Um, now, it says the prince of the covenant will sign, okay? Now, if it's Mohammed bin Salman, he's not going to be a prince for much longer. His dad is very ill in the hospital and, and expected mm -hmm. to die, very old and ill. So it has to happen if he's the prince of the covenant, which is highly likely, then it has to happen before his dad dies because he's got to sign it as a prince. Now, Jared Kushner has been called a princeling, you know, of, of the Western world um, because of his being groomed by the president of the United States, you know, and being helped to set up the Abraham Accords. Uh, there are articles uh, in many texts talking about how these two guys are like brother princes. They call them the princelings. Uh, so one of the two of them, I think, is going to be the one that signs that covenant. And that has to be reasonably soon um, for a number of reasons. Now, they've already drawn up a business plan, according to Jared Kushner. There's a, in fact, there's a link on my show images page. It's slide 52 and slide 53 and 4. Go to 52 and hear Jared Kushner talk for an hour and a half privately to this interviewer where he's talking about how they've already done a business plan for Gaza and how you know Gaza will uh, be freed of the Hamas uh, intrusion and will be able to set up its own government, but it will have a two-state solution you know, for, for Palestine at Gaza and uh, uh, Palestine in the West Bank. They will, they, those two will be part of the same country, but it will be a two-state solution to Israel. And they've already drawn up the paperwork, and as soon as Hamas is out there, they're going to give a billion dollars immediately to the new government of Gaza to start rebuilding from the war damage. And they're going to place over there in their governments in key places uh, observers to tell them if they start having uh, terrorists into the government, to the civilian government. This is already in the works. We'll watch for this in the next few months. Uh, you know, the, the war uh, in, in uh, Gaza, the Palestinians are having with the Israelis. This is going to suddenly end. And then this rebuilding process is going to occur, and they're going to sign this covenant agreement. And there will be many nations, at least 40 that we can see already, that will agree with the, the, the peace settlement and will sign the covenant along with Mohammed bin Salman and, uh, you know, the, the Gaza mm -hmm. people and uh, 
all the other countries involved. It's about to happen, so watch. Yeah. So, obviously, you mentioned these underground military bases, and I'm I'm interested to know about them because apparently in 1979 there was like a shootout between U.S. special forces and so-called aliens at an underground base in Dul is it Dulce, New Mexico, which apparently left 60 humans dead. I mean, yeah. What What's your opinion regarding that story? Because I I, have, oh. I can't remember the guy where you tell it, but one of them apparently was yeah, involved. Yeah, in Got lost about. some of his fing. He lost some of his fingers. Yeah, he's dead now. He died under some mm. circumstances. Anyway, yeah. Well, you know, of that particular battle, I don't know the details, but I do know that such a thing occurred not only there, but in a number of our other bases that we built for, including down to the Arctic, uh, it's, it's a Antarctic uh, sub uh, ice community we have down there. Um, that was the report that I heard the beginnings of it at lunch with Sir John and Sir Henry when he said they are moving in on us. And then toward the rest of the, of the 70s, late 70s, they kicked us out. There were running gun battles in these places and other places uh, to, you know, separate humans from the cultures, you know, that were underground. So, yeah, um, that Dulce, New Mexico thing, I've been up driven around that area looking at the terrain and various places. And there's a, a wonderful area um, close to um, oh, mm, Los Alamos uh, Nuclear Research Group. There's a like a big, big area, of miles and miles up, raised up as though it's the top of a bunch of volcanoes. I forget the name of that area, but that's very close to where Dulce uh, was. It's not quite in that; it's south of that. But um, it's it's um, an area that people don't travel to very often. Uh, they have to get permission, I think, most times to get into that area. And Los Alamos, of course, being the home of our nuclear research, is another reason for it to be there. But yes, yes, mm. we did uh, we did separate ways. There's no question about that. See, my my first thought when I heard that story was, if these are like fallen angels, why would they need guns? Because when we read it Bible, like the angel of death killed like thousands of just one angel, like they're way more powerful than we are. So why why are they having underground shootouts with humans? They will, I mean, to my mind, they wouldn't need to. Well, remember what I said, they were cast down without a lot of the mm. technology that they had in their first uh, habitation there in the uh, parallel universe. They had to make their own stuff down here. And they mm. did uh, start making advanced weaponry. But uh, the, the the battles there were not all shoot -em ups with, uh, with bullets on the alien side. Our side, yes, because we didn't have any more advanced technology. Mm. Um, a few sonic weapons and things like that, but nothing like they had. So the fact that they were using, uh, if they did in fact use our kind of weapons, is not because they didn't have the access to the other stuff. Maybe they thought that the use of those weapons would damage their facilities underground. So they opted out for exchange of lead or whatever. Um, so I can't speak to them because I, I don't yeah. know their mind on that. But uh, 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 yeah, look, they... They have the advanced technology. There's no question about it. Why they didn't use it, or if they did, I don't know. Mm. One one of the interesting things that always seems to come up, and you mention it, is like these reptilians, like and and obviously they've been called like archons. So they, I mean, at one point they would have been walking around. I think I spoke to Doctor Douglas Hamp about this, and we talked obviously about Satan when he was in the Garden of Eden, that he wasn't like a snake, what we think, slithering on his belly, it would have been like a upright, walking, serpentine creature. So the it, this is, when, we, when we've, we hear stories of reptilians, archons, whatever, that's what we're talking about, aren't we? We're talking like upright, walking, lizard-type men. Well, obviously in the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Satan being an erect being at that time, standing on, on two feet, uh, was cast down on his belly to crawl like a snake thereafter. He was changed. Um, in fact, in, in some of the briefing that I got with the project, they said that if you ever see one of the guys, I, I, well, I might have seen two of them, but anyway, it, it, if I had seen one of them in the sunlight, they say you'll notice it, on the back of their hands, if they turn them in the sunlight like that, it, it will light up. a. Their skin has like... Um, uh, 
the reptilian scales, if you wish, small scales. And it will be like an oil spill on the ground. It will have rainbow separations of color from the light. And you can tell them that way. I mean, we have skin cells, but uh, they're not like little scales. And he said, that's one of the reasons, one of the ways you can tell them. Plus, sometimes their eyes give them away. And, um, you know, uh, I, I don't think that they're, I mean, they're walking around. They aren't crawling around the ground. So I don't know why the Bible says, uh, you know, Satan, you'll be cast down and on the ground and you'll have to, you know, bite the heel of people. You'll, you'll be a snake. Uh, that might have been for that particular individual. But the other reptilians have been reported. I mean, uh, you know, in Louisiana, in various UFO reports, uh, one fellow was attacked. Or he, he chased him there in the dark of the, one of the bayous as a erect, uh, you know, reptilian type creature. Did you ever see that that series on uh, TV, the the V? Yeah, I used to watch yeah, it, it as a child. I went out. When I had a small black and white portable television in my room, and I used to watch it. <laughs> 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 Did you hide from your parents at night and look at it? Oh, it used to terrify me as a kid, and then I've watched it since as an adult. And you sort of look at it, and you, it's it's comical, really. It's good, but as a child, it, it frightened me. Did you see the biblical parallels that were used in that? Because these are reptilians in human form. Yeah, we yeah, come to yeah. okay. And did you see that? Like the thing that killed them off was the dried blood of a hybrid human and. Mm alien baby that dust you know spread and killed uh, there were many parallels to the, the bible and the prophecies of this time in that and i i've tried to contact the author several times because it, the way it was presented was you know like you say like a a childlike story but it was a way to put the the forecast of these things don't trust them into mm -hmm. the mind of people while they weren't aware that they were being told this you could yeah. fall back on it, and uh, it was marvelously done. I, I bought the rest of his books uh, as he continued to write about the other uh, invasion coming from other members of that, that reptilian race out there and to bring peace on Earth and all that kind of stuff. But it's a warning, and uh, mm. it definitely follows what the, the biblical prophecies for this time are. I, I used that in my home meetings uh, years ago. To uh, I'd show the movie, and then I'd say, okay, now... You saw them do this. You saw them do that. Here's the Bible equivalent of that. Wow. Okay. And it was a, a witness tool. Hmm. Yeah. They, they, that's what they do, don't they? These like they tell us what they're doing. Like they put it in films, and you know, so one of the ones that people are talking about. I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix. Is the um, Leave the World Behind, and it's a new one, and it's basically about a cyber attack. Yeah. I've heard I mean, about it, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I mean, you can see that you can see that you can see it happening basically when you when you watch it and you see like what goes on. There's this cyber attack. I mean, I think there's going to be one with the yeah. people I speak to, and and um, you know, it just looks like it's going that way. But um, one of the things I've heard you talk about is time and time travel. <laughs> Could you tell us what? I like how you describe time. Could you tell us what time is? Okay. Well, time is a ratio without really units. You might say five seconds or this or that, but what really happens is this. We observe motion of, say, a pendulum of a clock. It travels a distance in relation to how often a cesium atom expands and contracts, let's say. And we say this might expand and contract over here, you know, 40 million times a second versus tick of the clock every second. There's, we're measuring distances traveled and energy levels in essence, same thing. So there's no, you know, absolute time reference in the entire universe. Everything is built upon relativity of a certain, you know, subset, a, a planet, a, a star system, whatever. Now, because th this, what we call time is a record, a comparison of positions in space to this one, to that one, to that one, a clock, uh, to a, a TikTok clock, to a watch, this kind of stuff. Because of that, what we're talking about really is events. And events we place in timeline, if you wish, to go 
it back in time, I think is impossible. To go forward in time, yes. Can you come back once you've gone forward? No. So hmm. people from our ancient past, if they had the technology, could pop out here now, which these aliens have the technology to do. They could have gone to, you know, hibernate in essence in their field and then pop out now um, in our time. And uh, but, but going back, let's say if anyone could, it's already been done in our history. It's because we're living here now. And if anyone could have gone back, what we're seeing now is the result of it. it's not going to change. Yeah. Now, there was a an event in Brazil, I think it was. Um, the uh, the soldiers at an air force, uh, their air force base there at night saw a, a light landing in the paddocks out there on the uh, airfield. So they sent out a three or four man team with a sergeant uh, directing them, and they went out in the dark and they split up at a certain point. They said, "We'll be back here in you know 15 minutes or so. Let's go see if we can find that light." Well. Let's say the sergeant's name was Garcia. Garcia goes out, and his men come back, and he's not there. And they say, well, hey, where did Garcia go? A few minutes later, Garcia comes stumbling out of the dark. And muchachos, men, men, he says, uh, and he's in the state of collapse. They pick him up. He was clean shaven when he left them 15 minutes ago, but he had a five-day growth of beard all of a sudden. His watch time was way out of sync with them, hours. And he tells about going into this white light next to this field, or next to this field around the craft. And he spent five days in there, five days of his time growing that beard and then came back out. And that's showing relative time. What, what does that mean? It meant that events changing positions inside that field occurred a lot faster than outside because here we're kind of asleep while in there, things are going that quick. And the yeah. same thing happens in that field when you're turning a corner at 20,000 miles an hour, one of those aircraft, those spacecraft, the uh, electromagnetic craft. When you're going to make a turn at right angles, if you didn't have a way to amortize this inertia, this G-force, over many times more seconds, if you didn't have a way to do that, you would be killed in the turn. Your, your ship would collapse like an aluminum ball, just gone. So what they do in the craft is they generate the field that energizes your cells and the, the cells of the craft up uh, so that you are experiencing events a lot faster than the people uh, you know on the ground if you looked out the window during that time you'd see the people on the ground are like frozen in slow motion and they look at you and they say it turned that corner blink of an eye in that blink mm -hmm. of an eye they might have they might have experienced like five days six days ten days whatever it's because they were spreading out the G forces on the craft and the and the crew over a lot much larger time to allow them to not break, and uh, you know I joke about it, but you could you could say that you're on that craft and, and the captain of the craft says we're going to turn a corner here, uh, you know, break out the cards and and coffee here it'll be about twenty minutes and uh, you know, uh, and then they turn the corner and the field goes back to normal and, and everything's fine. Uh, but you've aged quicker than your twin on the earth. Uh, enough of those trips and you'd be an old man before your twin br brother was by a long shot. Uh, oh, wow. I suppose that's the best I can say about time. It's, um, it's yeah. relative. It's just events. It's, it's, yeah. It's like um, Chronicles of Narnia when they go into the wardrobe. And yeah. They, they're adults. And then when they come back to this world, they're still children. But it wouldn't yeah. be like that though, would it? Because if they aged there, they'd come back. Like you said, the guy had the beard growth. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's it's because I've had discussions with people at work and they've said to me, like, well, what is time? Time's just like artificial, it's invented. And and it, it's not an easy question to answer. Like, and that's why I wanted to ask you, because I've heard you spoke about it before. It's um, just comparing events, you know. Yeah. A set of events to another set of events. It's a and if you divide them out, uh, it becomes a number. But no, no real dimensions really. Even though they say seconds and hours, it's kind of mm. meaningless in the great scheme of things. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, I mean, Stan, I could I could talk to you all night, but I want to leave some stuff to talk to you about on another episode because I I have other things that I want to get into with you, but I I think it's probably prudent to bring it to a close now on that and then we can talk about other things again on another episode hopefully because I could, I could talk to you about... let me 
let me throw one thing of more on this time business before we get off. Yeah. Uh, in the Bible, it says um, a thousand years is as a day with the Lord. Now, mm -hmm. did that mean that a thousand of our years was as a day with him or a thousand of his years was with a day with us? Mm. A, thing, a thing to ponder because it's this relative time business. Yeah, it's a good question. That. I'm going to be thinking about that now. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, you know what? That I'd never. You read these verses sometimes, and you read them so many times. Sometimes you don't think about them properly. Yeah. And and I've not actually thought of it in that way. Actually, whether it, yeah. Remember when Thanks. Jesus saw Mary in the garden after he'd risen, and she, she was going mm. to run up and touch him, and he said, "Oh wait, don't touch me because uh, I haven't yet ascended to the Father." His mm. energy density, his, his experience of time would make his energy so uh, high, energy density, that it would hurt her to, to touch him. Mm. And so, you know, does he does he go up and, um, you know, time in the heavens, they look down at us, are we at slow motion, are we moving faster? Mm. You see, he would he would go negative, uh, negative time rate to us. Anyway, interesting things to, for you to, to ponder. When oh, you're yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be having to think about it. Um, so just before we go then, Stan, could you tell people where they can uh, get a hold of you, like about your website and the books that you offer? Because I know one of your books yeah. is Cosmic Conspiracy, but you have other ones as well. Okay, well, you, as far as the books and the uh, DVDs and things that we sell uh, on our site, if you go to uh, standeo.com, S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O.com, You'll see uh, at the beginning of the page a bunch of sublinks up there, um, but just scroll down probably two or three inches from the you know the top of the splash page, and you'll see our books, uh, pictures of them all across the page, and links then to our shopping cart, which uh, is where we tell you about the book and what's in it and where you can order it or the DVD or you know the PDF. We have all kinds of things there. And uh, we'll send it out to you, or you can download some of it from our uh, website. Uh, YouTube, you can go there, and on Rumble, I, you know, there are a number of uh, lectures and videos that I have on both uh, platforms. Um, and uh, recent interviews, you'll see a microphone up under the sign YouTube there in that, that site. And uh, that, that takes you back several years' worth of interviews with people like yourself. And uh, we either have video or audio recordings of all those that you can catch up with, you know, and uh, uh, I suppose that's the best way to do it, really. We we do answer our emails when we get them, and our email addresses are at the bottom of that page under contact us. And uh, Well, I'd very much encourage people. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to go and have a look at that and obviously listen to some of your other interviews that you've done because it's, it's fascinating. Like I said, I've listened to a number of them and when I first listened to you, I was like, definitely got to get Stan on this show. <laughs> so thanks for joining me. Um, thanks Thank to you. all my regular listeners who come back uh, week after week and welcome to any new listeners. I'm Paul and this is Beyond the Paradigm. Am I crazy? We don't use that word in here. <laughs>